I want to see uh, a review of perhaps Aboriginal policing in our smaller communities. Tonight, some answers from the head of the RCMP in Nunavut on police violence in the territory. So we're calling for real action, ending systemic racism in the policing, starting with ending racial profiling, carding or street checks at the federal level. That's something concrete that can be done. Reaction to the RCMP shooting death of Rodney Levi in New Brunswick. To go through this repeatedly over and over again with no accountability, no transparency, from those systems that are put in place to serve and protect us. It's, it's unbearable. And people gather across Turtle Island to remember Chantel Moore. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. We begin in New Brunswick, where a Mi'kmaq man was fatally shot by RCMP Friday night. Hours after RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky admitted there was systemic racism in the police force. This is the second fatal shooting in a week in New Brunswick when police have been responding to a call involving mental health concerns. Angel Moore reports. Rodney Levi was a 48-year-old father of three from Netamanagia First Nation. He was shot by RCMP after officers were called to a home in Sunny Corner near Miramichi and died shortly after in hospital. Chief Bill Ward says his community is looking for answers. I think they just called the cops just to, just to have them peacefully removed, I think, maybe. But it, it wasn't anything from what I'm hearing. There's no threats or violence or anything. At the scene, officers say they were confronted by a man carrying a knife. The RCMP said Saturday their officer deployed a taser but was unsuccessful, and then an officer reportedly fired his gun and Levi died around 9 p.m. Linda Levi, Rodney's older sister, said Rodney lived with mental illness. She believes the RCMP overreacted and that her brother should still be alive. We need, we need to bring back our own, our own policing. We need our role policing back. We don't, you know, we don't need no more RCMPs to do more damage than they already have. Levi's fatal shooting is the second in just a week. Chantel Moore was fatally shot on June 4th by an Edmonston police officer during a mental wellness check. Tensions are high and Chief Ward is asking RCMP officers to stay out of the community. People need time to grieve, and um, especially with everything happening, there is already a distrust there for the RCMP, unfortunately, and uh, this has only solidified that. The Quebec police watchdog is investigating both Levi and Moore's deaths. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Tripuktuk, Halifax. In Ottawa, Rodney Levi's death at the hands of the RCMP was cited as yet another example of the need for police reform. APTN's Todd Lamoran begins first with comments from the chief of Levi's community. He had the biggest heart that man loved his family so much. Mm -hmm. He had three beautiful children. Nedamanagia chief Bill Ward did a one-hour Facebook Live on Saturday. He said he spoke to Rodney Levi on the day of his death, saying he was in good spirits just hours beforehand. He had his demons, but he was always very friendly. Never tried to harm anybody. During his press conference today, the Prime Minister was asked specifically what his government will do, being reminded that Levi was one of six Indigenous people shot and killed by police since April. Trudeau again acknowledged systemic racism in Canada. We have made uh, steps to improve it, but there is a need for much more, uh, much quicker. And that's why we are working right now uh, with communities to address the first things that need to be done most rapidly, and we are going to move forward with them rapidly. But NDP leader Jagmeet Singh accused the government of empty gestures and wants Trudeau to do something immediately. So we're calling for real action, ending systemic racism in the policing, starting with ending racial profiling, carding or street checks at the federal level. That's something concrete that can be done. Singh continued in the House, saying systemic racism is killing people and some police funding should go elsewhere. 
When someone is in need of a wellness check or a mental health check, money should go, financing should go, support should go to mental health workers, healthcare workers, and not the police. Is the government prepared to do that? I spoke to Perry Bellegarde this morning because it is such a crucial issue. If you, we could describe it as the original sin of our country, and I absolutely agree that we need root and branch reform, including of how policing is done in Canada. Meanwhile, Saskatchewan Senator Lillian Dick called for RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky's resignation, saying she doesn't have the necessary knowledge or skills to remain in her position. Todd Lamoran, APTN National News, Ottawa. As reported last week, after giving interviews to other media outlets, RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky declined APTN's interview requests. After the RCMP shooting death of Rodney Levi, Lucky has again declined our request to speak with her. Healing walks for Chantelle Moore were also held across the Maritimes this weekend. In Halifax Saturday, hundreds walked in silence to begin the healing. They also remembered Rodney Levi, the Mi'kmaq man who was shot by New Brunswick RCMP and died in hospital the night before the walk for Moore. News of Levi's death left organizers shocked. Anishinaabe artist and activist Raven Davis had this to say. To go through this repeatedly over and over again with no accountability and no transparency from those systems that are put in place to serve and protect us, it's, it's unbearable. Vancouver also held a rally over the weekend to honor Chantel Moore. APTN's Tina House was there and has this story. About 200 people gather on the steps of the Vancouver Art Gallery to honor the life of Chantel Moore, a 26-year-old Indigenous mother who was fatally shot five times by an Edmiston, New Brunswick City police officer who was called to do a wellness check. The gathering is in stark contrast to the estimated 300,000 people who gathered at the same location just two weeks ago for a Black Lives Matter rally after George Floyd's murder by police in Minneapolis. Tabitha Frank is Chantel's aunt. She was loved by many. She was 26 years old and she had a daughter named Gracie and now she's not going to be able to grow up with a mom and it's it's tough especially for all our nations on Vancouver Island um, Tofino Port Alberni she grew up in Port Alberni it's hard for her mom and I thank everybody for coming out here since her death Outrage has boiled over in Indigenous communities and others who are calling for an end to systemic racism in policing. This event happened a day after another Indigenous man, Rodney Levi, was also fatally shot by RCMP in New Brunswick. Dakota Bear helped organize today's event. I'm sick of my stomach that we're living through a pandemic and still one by one our people, Indigenous peoples, Black peoples, people of colour are being murdered and and threatened on a daily basis, harassed, killed in the streets by the same people that swore an oath to protect us. Frank is part of the dance troupe Butterflies in Spirit, whose purpose it is to raise awareness for murder to missing Indigenous women and girls. And her sisters came to support her. Here we're in 2020 and we're still having to come out and say, please stop shooting our people. When will this stop? Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Nunavut RCMP are under increasing scrutiny with two fatal police shootings, a third where the person survived and video of a violent arrest in a small community. Our Kent Driscoll sat down to talk with Nunavut's head RCMP officer. You've probably seen the video by now. Nunavut RCMP in the town of Kingite arrest a man who can barely walk, violently. Chief Superintendent Amanda Jones commands all RCMP in Nunavut. Her officers made this arrest. We asked, why the knee strikes after the truck hit? Just I find it difficult to understand how someone is resisting after they've already, they couldn't walk before you guys showed up. Then they've been hit with the truck door. I'm wondering how hard could he have been resisting? 
Yeah, I'm going to leave that with the Ottawa Police Service, right? Because I'll, um, obviously it's under investigation. I saw that. I, I question it myself. Um, but I'll leave that to Ottawa Police Service to determine the use of force in that, whether or not it was uh, reasonable or um, something that was not reasonable. Almost 100% of Nunavut's investigations about police misconduct are done through the Ottawa Police Service so that it isn't Nunavut police investigating themselves. It happens often, six times already this year. These reports are given to the government of Nunavut and the RCMP, not to the public. Here's former Premier, then regular member, Paul Uklik, asking about those reports in 2017. And uh, I want to see uh, a review of perhaps Aboriginal policing in our smaller communities. We asked the Justice Department to comment on that story back in 2017. They didn't return several phone calls. We asked the Justice Department to comment on this story in 2020. They didn't return several phone calls. Ukulik's comments were sparked after a different RCMP video had been made public. This one showing a man being attacked by RCMP while in his cell in 2015. He was left on the floor naked and bleeding. Ottawa Police Services found no wrongdoing. The officers acted within the rules. Here's another sore point. There hasn't been a new Inuk RCMP officer in 15 years. This video is from 2009 when they were trying to encourage recruitment. Jones says they're still trying. But you aren't guaranteed to get an Inuktitut speaker when you call dispatch. We asked if the RCMP keeps saying the same things and nothing changes, why should Nunavumi believe them? Well, this time we have created uh, what I call a B-Division pre-deployment training, which is uh, two weeks of training for any member who's coming up uh, to Nunavut, because we recognize that even the members themselves say, I wasn't set up for success, right? I didn't have an understanding of the culture. I Nunavut is changing rapidly. This was the RCMP headquarters back in 2007. This is current RCMP headquarters in Iqaluit. What hasn't changed? Almost everything else about policing in Nunavut. Ottawa still investigates, results are hard to get, and Inuit recruitment is at an all-time low. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Iqaluit. To Alberta now, where RCMP have charged a second suspect in connection to the fatal shootings of two Métis hunters in late March. In a press release, police said Roger Bilodeau of Glendon, Alberta is facing two counts of second-degree murder. Co-accused Anthony Bellodeau, also of Glendon, is already charged with two counts of second-degree murder and has pleaded not guilty. Jacob Sampson and his uncle Maurice Cardinal were killed on a rural road near Glendon, about 200 kilometers north of Edmonton, after police said an argument broke out between the two occupants of two vehicles. Police said shots were fired after a third vehicle arrived on the scene. The Métis men were said to be hunting for food for their families during the COVID-19 pandemic under the Métis Harvester Act. Still to come, how leaders in Quebec are reacting to the latest report on systemic racism. Stick around. Here's a look at Tuesday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. 27 and sunny in Fredericton, 26 in Halifax, 10 in Nain, showers and 19 for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Sunny and 26 in Montreal and Quebec City, 28 in Saguenay. 24 in Toronto under sunny skies, 27 in Ottawa. Showers in 28 for Thunder Bay, 31 under the sun in Sioux Lookout. Plus 4 with rain in Churchill, 27 for God's Lake and Thompson. 31 and showers in Winnipeg, 30 in rain in Brandon. Showers in 25 for Regina, 21 with rain for Saskatoon. 23 in Meadow Lake and La Ronde. Welcome back. Well, all eyes remain on how provincial governments will address the issues of racism and police violence. Leaders in Quebec have struggled with repeated findings of bias in its ranks. But on Monday, with the tabling of yet another report on systemic discrimination, it seems concrete actions could be soon to come. Lindsay Richardson has more. On peut parler d'un réveil collectif. 
Call it a collective awakening, says Montreal Mayor Valerie Plante of a newly released citizen-led report which concluded Montreal has long turned a blind eye to its issues of systemic discrimination. Plante mobilized hours after the report's release. Its first recommendation, acknowledge the issue. Starting today at City Council, I will propose a statement to recognize the systemic nature of racism and discrimination, to affirm the city's, city's solidarity with the thousands of citizens who denounce racism and discrimination in all its forms. As seen in recent weeks, leaders in Quebec struggle with use of the term systemic. I disagree with the definition of a, a systemic racism and are lagging on recommendations made in prior reports. But this 260-page document synthesizing over 7,000 individual testimonies confirms the initiatives of the city are scattered, and there is a discrepancy between the vision of a metropolis of reconciliation and the actual measures taken. For example, Montreal appointed an Indigenous Affairs Commissioner, but is yet to renew her mandate. Last summer, Montreal renamed a controversial street but other colonial relics remain. Police violence so persistent and response so slow that First Nations organizations penned a letter to the feds imploring them to act immediately. All those nice words and nice thoughts and speeches that they give uh, on, our on a daily basis, we need action. At the provincial level, Premier Francois Legault, while adamant that systemic racism doesn't exist, announced a new anti-racism task force on Monday. Their mandate will be to identify the actions that we can take against racism in sectors where there are problems. The group will turn in their findings next fall. Regarding this new report, Plant says she'll appoint a commissioner to combat racism. To combat police violence, they're reconsidering body cams and the policy on street checks. Other specific recommendations to consider, updating the city's charter to reflect the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, mandatory sensitivity training for civil servants, better bias screening for police officers, and establishment of an Indigenous cultural centre in Montreal. Thanks to this report, we have a roadmap to guide our efforts. It will allow us to move forward quickly. A roadmap that many hope does not lead to yet another dead end. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. An Edmonton mother wants a mural removed from a local transit train station. She says it is a painful reminder of residential schools. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. This mural was hung in Edmonton's Grandin LRT station in 1989. It depicts a bishop and nun removing a baby from an indigenous family. You can see a residential school in the background. In 2014, Métis artist and current Edmonton City Councilor Aaron Paquette added additional panels, along new work of the original artist Sylvie Nadeau, who is not indigenous. Those murals show a buffalo and the baby who is now grown into a man. Now, Jade Bologna, a mother you know, of indigenous children, and, says and she and wants the original mural taken down. She says it is racist and a painful reminder of the residential school system. She is circulating a petition to remove it. There are still people who are, you know, hurt, unaffected by it, especially if they have no option but to take transit, so they have to walk by that every day. She doesn't want her children to have to see the reminder of residential schools. If they can see, oh, my mom can maybe stand up for something she believes in, maybe they can do the same thing for their community when they're older as well. Bologna says the mural should be moved to a museum. Or if it stays, a plaque explaining the residential school system and the harm it caused. There's nothing publicly explaining what is happening in this picture or, you know, exactly how it relates to our past. The petition currently has over 4,000 signatures. Councillor Paquette is not available to comment on this story before airtime. And original artist Sylvie Nadeau says she will not be commenting. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Coming up, a powwow for Mohawk elders in long-term care homes. Stick around.
Here's a look at the rest of your Tuesday weather forecast, picking back up in northern Alberta. Sunny in 23 for Fort McMurray, 19 in Grand Prairie, 20 with showers in Medicine Hat, 21 in rain in Edmonton, 17 under sunny skies in Vancouver, 18 for Victoria, 14 and rain in Fort Nelson, 20 and sunny in Prince George. 21 in Old Crow, showers and 12 for Whitehorse. 13 and rain for Fort Liard and Trout Lake, showers and 17 in Yellowknife. 8 in Saks Harbor, 19 for Politak. 4 with a chance of snow in Repulse Bay, 8 in Cambridge Bay. Plus 4 in Resolute and Glulee. Welcome back. Normally this time of year, Ganawage Mohawk Territory would be gearing up for its annual powwow. But like many events, the powwow is a casualty of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nevertheless, on Sunday, they took the trouble to throw a small-scale version for some honoured guests. Tom Fenario explains. John McCumber prepares the drum like he always does, with a tobacco offering. Except today, it's a little different. His local drum group, the Red Tail Spirit Singers, are performing with four drums in order to maintain social distancing. It's a little harder on the lungs to sing, yeah, because uh, we're like six feet apart and today it's kind of windy, so it's hard to hear everybody's voice, but I think we're doing okay. But for McCumber, any loss of quality control is worth it because today they have a special audience. I want to say hello to our elders upstairs and out on the balcony. This powwow is taking place in front of the Cattery Memorial Hospital, where many Mohawk elders stay in long-term care. Lifting up their spirits, you know, to they're not going to miss out on, on this powwow. <laughs> Elders watched from their windows as dancers treated them to a grand entry. An honor song for healthcare workers. And the Haudenosaunee smoke dance. Uh, having an event like this is certainly inspiring. Just hearing the drums behind me right now, but you know, this, this is my spirit, and I'm sure this is the spirits of, of all the people here. As a matter of fact, both my parents are right upstairs here in, this, in, in the Cattery Hospital, so it's very good to see them and see them smiling and waving. The powwow isn't the only reason to smile these days. Kahnawake has had 23 positive cases of COVID-19, but only two remain active. No one has died. Remarkable, as their Quebecois neighbors in Montreal and surrounding suburbs have been the hardest hit in Canada. Nearly 4,000 have died, especially the elderly in long-term care homes. Well, I think it's really about the importance that we place on our elders in our community, our language, our history, our culture. They are all contain they are all with our elders and so it's very important for us to protect them I have great respect for them and I'm sure we all do have great respect for them because they are the people here who taught us to be who we are today and today their elders are still here thanks in part to the physical and spiritual vigilance of their fellow community members Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Kahnawake, Mohawk Territory. What a great idea and a great way to leave you tonight. You can find more on all the stories you watched here over on our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here tomorrow.